Good afternoon and welcome to the virtual public workshop for Del Dot's Kings Highway, Dartmouth Drive to Freeman Highway project. My name is Brian Behrens and I'm a group engineer in Del Dot's project development south section. With me tonight is our project manager for the project, Ed Robles, who will take you through most of the presentation. Rob Wills and Brett Abrahamson, who are members from our design consultant, Whitman Reckhart and Associates, and Rosemary Richardson and Jill Cravens, who are part of our real estate team. Uh, next slide, Brett. So the purpose, um, before, we, before we get into the presentation, we really just want to take you through uh, some housekeeping items. The, the purpose of our workshop tonight is to obtain your input on our current design um, and for us to provide all of you an update on where we are in our project schedule. The comment period for this will be open until March 25th. We're asking that everyone use the online comment form and survey that is currently up on our project website. Uh, but of course, you're also free to call us or email us directly with any of your comments. Uh, Ed's email is there at the bottom of this slide and it will also be at the end of the presentation and it's also on our project website as well. Next slide. There are, uh, before, we, uh, before we really get into it, we do like to start all of our presentations uh, with our Dell Dot mission, excellence in transportation, every trip, every mode, every dollar, every one. And as a, our project team, speaking for them, we're really excited to share with you tonight the progress we've made so far on this project, um, on this very important project for the Lewis area. So there's several ways to participate tonight in addition to logging in uh, virtually, which mo most of you have done. If for some reason your connection isn't working or you miss parts of our presentation, it is being recorded and it will be posted to our project website and to Dell Dot's YouTube channel. Questions can be asked tonight using the, the Q&A box in Zoom. You can flip to the next one, Brett. If you're unable to do that, uh, you can also email your questions directly to Ed at any time during the presentation. Each question will then be, is going to be reviewed uh, and our panelists will respond uh, verbally or directly in the chat if it's applicable. So getting into the project now, uh, the purpose of this project is primarily focused on improving the traffic operations by adding additional capacity. This will be accomplished by constructing additional travel lanes and improving the intersections along the corridor. We are looking to convert this corridor from two lanes to four lanes, two lanes in each direction that will extend the limits of that project from basically from Dartmouth to the split with Freeman Highway. The secondary needs are really focused on improving the multimodal aspects of the transportation network. We're gonna install shared use paths along both sides of Kings Highway, uh, and also look to implement some of the local initiatives. And mostly we're talking about the Kings Highway and Gills Neck Road master plan. Um, so to get you to the overview of the, the, the general project, this is the current concept that shows the, the limits of the corridor and our project, which extend basically from SR1 to the split with Freeman Highway. Ed's gonna take you through our typical sections and the specific intersection highlights uh, in the next few slides. But this shows you an overview of the entire project. Uh, we are proposing to reconstruct all of the existing major intersections along the corridor at Dartmouth, at Clay, at Gills Neck, and at the split with Freeman Highway. And then we're proposing to add a new intersection in between Gills Neck Road and Freeman Highway. This would line up with the current entrance uh, to the new BB Medical Facility um, and also provide a fourth leg and a connection to the proposed Mitchell Farm and Zwanendale Farm inter uh, subdivision. Also, before we move on, if you could just uh, hop back, Brett, we'd want to kind of take a brief moment just to acknowledge the Kings Highway and Gills Neck Road master plan effort that was taken on by the city of Lewis and the historic Lewis byways. It was in collaboration with Del Dot and other stakeholders uh, and just kind of highlight some of the key aspects where we've incorporated those themes into this project and then also highlight where we deviate from them. So included in this project that's also included in the master plan is a boulevard type of approach to this project. So the typical section that Ed's going to take you through will show curved medians with minimal shoulder width. Uh, that's to kind of make that more of a boulevard type feel. It also incorporates the anticipated traffic growth for the planned developments that are coming. Uh, we do include shared use paths on both sides of Kings Highway, as I mentioned before, and that's for the entire length of the corridor. It also includes connections to the local trail network, the Junction and Breakwater Trail and the Lewis to Georgetown Trail. We do also focus most of our widening to the south side of Kings Highway, where the planned development is proposed to not impact anything existing. 
uh, and we are planning to use uh, linear infiltration as our primary stormwater management technique. Um, in addition to that, we are budgeting right away to include landscaping uh, where it's feasible. Where we deviate from the master plan um, is really at the intersection control types. Roundabouts were determined to be uh, the chosen intersection control at all of the major intersections. Some of them were proposed in the master plan, but we, we went further with it. Um, the safety benefits really uh, were there as compared to the signalized intersections, and they really work better from an operational standpoint with uh, level of service and the delay in queuing that we see from our traffic analyses. Um, we also feel that they contribute to the calming effect that was outlined in the master plan. Um, and then the primary difference is we extend the four lane section all the way to the Freeman split. Um, and that, again, that was based on the traffic need that we see, uh, the capacity issues that are out there and that we know are coming. Uh, so that's kind of an overview of the general project. Ed, I'm gonna turn it over to Ed now and he's gonna take you through each of the intersections and then we will open it up for questions. Thanks, Brian. Hello, everyone. Um, I, as Brian mentioned, I'm Ed Robles. I am the project manager for, the, uh, for this project, the Kings Highway. Uh, from SR1 to Freeman Highway Capital Project. And uh, I will now be taking you um, through the slides and going over the proposed improvements in uh, a bit more detail. Um, so we are proposing to dualize Kings Highway uh, with two 11 foot travel lanes in each direction with five foot outside shoulders. Um, the highway will have a uh, curved median uh, varying in width between 16 feet to six foot wide. Um, we're also proposing uh, shared use paths along both sides of Kings Highway. Um, it will, the shared use path will be 10 foot wide um, uh, in most places, but uh, as uh, Brian mentioned earlier, um, the right of way gets a little narrower as you go north. So there are some places where we will have to decrease that to eight foot wide. Uh, we'll also be providing connections to existing um, shared use paths and sidewalk network in the, uh, in the SR1 uh, corridor uh, via Kings Highway and Dartmouth Drive. Um, we will be incorporating uh, new bus stops, um, installing uh, rapid flashing beacon, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, uh, RRFBs, um, at critical pedestrian crossings. Um, as Brian mentioned, we're gonna be doing an overhaul of the uh, roadside swales and um, stormwater management facilities along the corridor. Um, also, we are incorporating an access road to consolidate some existing entrances near the Northern project limits. Uh, and we are proposing roundabouts along uh, all intersections along this corridor, uh, which include the ones that Brian mentioned earlier, Dartmouth, Dartmouth Drive, uh, a single lane roundabout with a bypass lane, uh, multi-lane uh, roundabouts at the Kings Highway and Clay Road intersections, as well as the Kings Highway and Gills Neck Road intersections. Um, there's also a multi-lane roundabout at the future entrance to the BB Medical and Zwanendale Farm entrance and another multi-lane uh, roundabout with a bypass lane along Freeman Highway. So Brett, can, yeah, thank you. Um, so this slide shows the existing typical section along the Kings Highway corridor, uh, which consists of two 11 foot travel lanes with eight foot to 10 foot wide paved shoulders. Uh, if you could go to the next slide, Brett. Uh, and on this uh, slide, uh, this, this shows the proposed typical section uh, that's, uh, that we are incorporating the boulevard uh, type design that Brian mentioned earlier uh, to this corridor, consisting of four travel lanes, two in each direction, separated by a 16 foot grass median with curb, two foot interior shoulders with five foot exterior shoulders, we're also including um, a 10 foot wide shared use path on both sides of Kings Highway uh, with a wide grass buffer between the shoulder and the path. Also proposing to carry this type of um, section as far as we, uh, as we can along this corridor, uh, which we found to be from the intersection of Dartmouth Drive 
to uh, features one in Dale BB medical entrance roundabout, which is, um, if you could go back one more slide, Brett. Right, so that's the area uh, highlighted in yellow there at the bottom. So next slide. Um, however, uh, as you can see on, the, on this slide, uh, we found the need to reduce that median width uh, north of the roundabout um, at this one in Dale entrance. Um, due to the lack of available space, well, we reduced the median to a six foot wide concrete median uh, and had to reduce the shoulders, uh, the interior shoulders to one feet, one foot, and uh, the shared use path to eight foot in some areas uh, with narrower grass buffers to reduce impacts to existing buildings and structures. Um, we're also proposing a closed drainage section on this area. Uh, again, to due to those space constraints. Uh, if you can go to the next slide. So now I will um, walk you through the proposed concept plan, um, starting with this slide, which is this, which show the the southern limits of the capital project. Um, just so that we're all on the same page and everyone everyone gets their bearings. Uh, north is to the right of the page, uh, coastal highway is shown on the left side of the page. Um, so this slide shows the proposed improvements to be constructed under a separate Dell DOT project, um, the SR1 and Kings Highway intersection improvements, uh, which center along the pedestrian crossing of Kings Highway. Um, but these improvements will be done ahead of the, this capital project, the Kings Highway capital project. Uh, and this slide is just to show you how we uh, plan on connecting the uh, shared use path and sidewalk to this um, network. Um, so Brad, if you could go to the next slide. So as we head north uh, or east along Kings Highway, we get to our first roundabout located at the intersection of Dartmouth Drive and Kings Highway. Um, as you can see, SR1 is on the left of the page and the previous slide's match line is on the bottom side. The existing Kings Highway and Dartmouth Drive stop controlled intersection uh, will be converted to a single lane roundabout um, that will include a single bypass lane uh, provided for Kings Highway eastbound movements and uh, a double bypass lane uh, to be provided for the Kings Highway westbound movement onto Dartmouth Drive. Um, as mentioned previously, uh, shared use paths are provided on both sides of Kings Highway throughout the project limits. Uh, pedestrian crossings are located at all roundabouts and they will be assisted by rectangular rapid flashing beacons, or RFBs. Um, these beacons are activated by pedestrians uh, via a push button. So when activated, these beacons uh, emit a high frequency LED uh, flashes, which alert motorists uh, to the fact that pedestrians may be in the crosswalk. Uh, as you go towards the right of the page, um, we are including various interval. Um, uh, yes, we are including um, start bus uh, services uh, along the corridor. And so we are showing some of the bus stops locations. Uh, and right next to that sign, uh, you, you will see our stormwater uh, facilities. So um, those are the potential stormwater facilities. Um, the thin blue line shown uh, is our preferred alternative, which is to use infiltration ditches along the corridor. However, uh, we don't have all the field data back at this time uh, to complete the design. So, so we are showing essentially our plan B, if you will. Uh, which would be to construct a stormwater detention, detention pond um, depict, depicted here uh, in the big blue rectangle. Um, so once we have all our field data back, uh, we will be able to finalize uh, the type, size, and location of our stormwater facility. Um, also depicted in this area uh, and throughout the corridor uh, are these circles, uh, which represent potential locations for landscaping. Um, 
that's something that as Brian mentioned before that came out of the Kings Highway and Gills Neck Road master plan uh, that we are accommodating in our concept plan. Um, something else that I would pull in, point out uh, in that in, is that uh, intersecting side roads uh, located between roundabouts, uh, such as the Savannah Drive East, kind of located near the top of your page, um, will operate as uh, right in, right out only. Um, full access to all movements is provided uh, via the adjacent roundabouts, which brings us to the next slide. So in this slide, um, it's kind of to illustrate how vehicles can use the roundabouts to access Kings Highway in either direction. Uh, so in this slide, a vehicle uh, leaving Savannah Drive can head east on Kings Highway by making a right out of Savannah Drive and go around the roundabout and exit onto eastbound Kings Highway. If you go to the next slide. Um, and then on this slide, a vehicle headed north or east along Kings Highway from SR1 needing to enter Savannah Drive can do so by using Clay, the Clay Road roundabout and heading west uh, or south onto Kings Highway and making a right turn onto Savannah, as shown by that purple line. So as we continue to head northeast along the Kings Highway corridor, we get to the intersection with Clay Road. Uh, this is an existing signalized intersection that will be converted to a multi-lane roundabout. Uh, similar to previous uh, slides, the shared use path continue to be shown on both side of, sides of Kings Highway. Uh, we are showing bike slip ramps um, provided um, for road using cyclists wishing to avoid navigating the roundabout. Um, again, pedestrian crossings are provided along each leg of the multi-lane roundabouts um, along, uh, along with our RFPs. Um, a fourth uh, intersection leg will be provided on the south side of Kings Highway. Um, this uh, leg uh, is provided to um, kind of taking access to uh, the Townsend uh, barn parcel, as well as future access to the village center development. Uh, also shown on this slide is another possible stormwater location um, depicted on the northeast quadrant of Kings Highway and Clay Road intersection. Uh, we're continuing to show the landscaping um, along the corridor. Um, so as everyone uh, will notice, this uh, multi-lane roundabout um, has a bit of a kink to it. And uh, that's because it's not a, a typical multi-lane roundabout with two full through lanes all the way around it, but uh, it's more of a hybrid turbo roundabout. Um, so the reason that we chose to implement this uh, roundabout design is uh, due to its uh, safety features um, when compared to a typical multi-lane roundabout. Uh, with, the with this design, a vehicle headed westbound on Kings Highway that wants to turn left towards the future village center development on the kind of bottom of the page uh, would need to get onto the left lane as they approach the roundabout, enter into the inner, uh, inner lane of the roundabout and stay in it. And as they go around, halfway around the roundabout, the user would automatically be uh, located on the outermost lane uh, of the roundabout and can easily make that right turn into um, that exit, into that, um, that leg of the roundabout. So this design um, eliminates a conflict point within the roundabout, um, thereby making it safer and uh, sustaining traffic flow along the corridor. So next slide. Um, so in this slide shows the next intersection along the Kings Highway corridor, which is the intersection with Gills Neck Road. Um, this is another signalized intersection that will be converted to a multi-lane roundabout with the hybrid geometry included in its design. 
the shared use paths uh, continue along both sides of the corridor. Um, and something common al uh, along the corridor will be that uh, we drop that five foot shoulder on the, round, um, on the roundabout approaches. Um, and that is to encourage your bicyclists, uh, bicycle users to get into the shared use path to cross the intersection uh, by using the bike slip ramps. Um, understanding that most experienced bike users that use the shoulder will probably stay on the travel lane, um, but that's those slip ramps are, are uh, there for more of the recreational type users. Um, also including in this uh, slide are RRFBs, uh, major pedestrian crossings, and uh, that white or that uh, blue line represents our, our stormwater management facility um, as proposed, as well as the landscaping that's right next to it. Uh, something else that I should mention before we continue uh, is regarding the traffic analysis that we did for the corridor. Um, as Brian touched on earlier, um, obviously the projected traffic volumes warranted the dualization of Kings Highway, but uh, we also completed an analysis um, of each intersection and did a comparison of signal versus roundabout. And um, that, that analysis showed that uh, the multi-lane roundabouts performed better uh, than signalized intersections overall. Uh, we go to the next slide. Um, so this slide shows the proposed roundabout at a new intersection, um, that being the future Kings Highway intersection with BB Medical on the top of your page, um, and the senior uh, and the Swan and Dale Farm subdivision uh, on the bottom of the page. Um, the BB Medical Center is currently under construction, and uh, Swan and Dale Farms is planned. Um, again, we're showing uh, shared use paths, bike, bike slip ramps, and RFBs uh, along the corridor. Um, here you can also see that as you move east of this intersection, uh, we begin to see the change in the typical section. Uh, the typical section transitions to a tighter, tighter um, profile with a narrower uh, six foot uh, median and uh, reduced buffer. Uh, and shared use path widths um, are also reduced to limit impacts to adjacent properties. If you can go to the next slide. Um, and then this slide um, shows the intersection of Kings Highway and Freeman Highway, uh, which is our northern project limits. The um, Existing Kings Highway and Freeman Highway stop controlled intersection uh, will be converted to a multi lane roundabout uh, with an eastbound bypass lane to Freeman Highway. Um, again, this isn't um, a typical multi lane roundabout, as our analysis uh, did not show the need to continue those two through lanes further east. Um, however, we are maintaining those two through lanes westbound um, as they were needed. Um, as you look at the entrance to Bay Breeze uh, Drive, um, the inter, uh, that intersection, the geometry will be reduced uh, and simplified. Um, this entrance will be uh, right in, right out only, and uh, users will be encouraged to use the roundabout to go westbound on Kings Highway. Uh, we found this to be the best solution as uh, making lefts out of the community under current conditions uh, is difficult. It's very difficult and it would be even more so with the design year traffic volumes. Um, also shown here is an access road that will be introduced um, north of the proposed Kings Highway um, path where existing Kings, Kings Highway is located. Um, this access road will consolidate several of these business entrances um, to improve the safety and access uh, from these businesses onto Kings Highway. Uh, share use paths and RFBs are included um, 
for connectivity to adjacent to the adjacent uh, junk water uh, junction breakwater and Lewis to Georgetown Trail systems. Um, also shown here is a uh, potential stormwater facility uh, in this space that uh, will be vacated uh, by the exist that is currently uh, taken up by the existing roadway. Um, we're also uh, showing on this display that uh, the Lewis Lighthouse will need to be relocated um, as part of this project. And the plan is to relocate it behind the proposed uh, shared use path and for it to remain uh, visible to motorists coming and going from Lewis. Um, so this slide shows our, our current project schedule. Um, we ask that everyone submit any comments regarding this project uh, by March 25th. If there are no major changes to the project concept presented today, we will continue with the project design and plan on having final right-of-way plans uh, by the end of the summer, by the end of this summer, um, and begin uh, right-of-way acquisitions this fall. Um, by the current capital transportation program, the CTP, we are uh, scheduled to spend right away funds in the uh, 2023 fiscal year and begin construction in the 2026 fiscal year. And that brings us to the end of our presentation. Um, we can now begin the Q&A portion of the workshop. This slide um, shows the uh, panel, mem panel members that will be available to answer questions tonight. Um, so I'm gonna ask Brett if you could just go back to the slide that has the Dartmouth intersection. So I'm gonna go through some of these questions uh, and I might throw it to some of our panel members. I'll try to answer the ones uh, that I can and then I'll throw it to Ed or Brett or Rob. Um, or our real estate team, if uh, one of those comes up. So first question that we have is, is what is a bypass lane? So um, so basically, we kind of have two questions about that. So what is a bypass lane? And then does a roundabout with a bypass lane give priority to the primary route of travel? So the bypass lane that we're talking about, um, Brett, if you could just use your cursor to go along Kings heading east, if you can follow that cursor. That's a bypass for, for those traveling on Kings Highway who wish to remain on Kings Highway. They don't need to get into the roundabout. So very similar to what they would do today. Uh, so just keep going. Um, and as you can see, like where that comes out, it's it, you're in your own lane the entire time. So there's no merging there. Um, once you're in that bypass lane, you can remain in that lane. And then once you're out of you know that queue uh, or where the, uh, where the other path is coming in from the roundabout leaving, you know, there's, then you can merge and switch lanes and things of that nature, but um, you have your own lane. Uh, and then the double bypass lane coming westbound is really because of that predominant movement at this intersection where we've got a lot of people heading to the signal at route one, and it works the same way. It's just got two lanes of traffic, but each have their own lane. Um, everyone else is accommodated by movements can, that can be made in the roundabout, but that's what the bypass lanes are for. And the one at, at Freeman works the same way. Um, okay, let me keep going here. Uh, next question is why are the travel lanes 11 feet? Um, and the wide lanes really seem to encourage people to speed. So that's a good question. That's been a bit of a shift actually recently for Del Dot. Um, a few years ago, if we were starting this project, the lanes probably would have been 12 feet. Um, so we are this type of a roadway, uh, we are really trying to move to, uh, uh, to the 11 foot through lanes. 10 feet is, is really narrow. Um, and, um, but we can look at things, you know, where it's 10 and a half. We certainly have done that on other projects, but 11 feet is appropriate for this type of a roadway um, and the types of uh, travel along it. But good question. Uh, next question is, is this project going right through the existing Warren S. Gold Gateway Garden? So um, if you could go Brett to all the way to the other end to Freeman, um, so yes, I guess is the general answer to that question. We actually do create 
uh, quite a bit of green space by by redoing this intersection, if you will, by repurposing the right of way and installing the, the roundabout that Ed described. Um, we do create a bit of green space uh, for other opportunities for something that's similar like that. Um, we do have uh, shared use, or I'm sorry, uh, stormwater management um, proposed in that, you know, to kind of use that right of way. And to, as Ed mentioned, we are looking to basically shift the lighthouse to have it be something that's visible, you know, for everyone coming to and from Lewis as it is today, uh, but also an attraction for folks using the trail network um, right there. So we think that that's, that will be a good thing, but I think that there's opportunities there for something to be planted, to have something similar. And that's, that's going to be, at least from my perspective in the project team, I think I could speak for them that that's a large part of our project development from this point is, is some of the extras that are going to go into this project. And um, I know we've got some other questions related to landscaping and um, you know, how, how that looks and who maintains it uh, going forward. Um, kind of on that topic, the next question is, uh, is there any way that trees can be added to the center median? So uh, we are not showing something like that right now. Um, trees in the median, you know, they are an object that can be struck. Uh, so from a safety perspective, I don't think that that's something that the project team would recommend. Um, at this time, but that's not to say that landscaping or, sh or uh, shrubberies or plantings cannot be uh, coordinated throughout the project development process. Okay. Um, okay, next question uh, or comment is, is basically, um, the question is, could we add the roundabout in front of the high school at Gills Neck Road? Um, could we do that last? So this is more of a question about phasing. Uh, I guess the, the comment is, has to do with um, the volume of traffic at certain times uh, near the school and the large volume of inexperienced drivers who would be using the roundabout. Um, um, doing it last would allow the students to get used to using the roundabout at the other intersections before they have to use this one. So that's a good question. The, the I may turn this over to Brett to kind of talk about our phasing just in general, um, but it, doing it last, um, it, it's likely that they're all gonna kind of be built in in whatever phase we're doing along the corridor. But Brett, if you wouldn't mind taking that one. Sure, yeah, like Brian said, um, we, we do have some flexibility in kind of ordering these roundabouts, but in large part, we're kind of um, more looking at it at a corridor perspective. So in general, the phasing will go, we would be constructing this south side of Kings Highway where the majority of the widening is. That gives us additional room then to maintain traffic um, for future phases. So um, I can't give a, an exact answer uh, now for that because the phasing is still being worked on, but uh, a good comment and definitely something we can consider. Thanks, Brett. Okay, um, next couple of comments coming through. Um, so you see five roundabouts are, are proposed on Kings Highway. As an engineer with safety background, I love roundabouts. Uh, including those in the Minus Conaway uh, project. Uh, however, the majority of local people, when I talk to them, detest them. Uh, what is DelDOT doing to educate local citizens so they will support DelDOT's efforts to replace the existing traffic lights on Kings Highway with five roundabouts, uh, as well as the other roundabouts proposed uh, in the Eastern Sussex region? So um, that's a good comment. We do have a lot of projects that are now including or recommending roundabouts as the main intersection control type. Um, and really that has mostly to do with safety. Um, uh, the safety benefits of roundabouts are well documented. Uh, so the um, I think that there will be there will be a, um, a people will will get used to them. I guess is the right phrase as they're starting to use them. Um, but the education effort is a good comment. And I think Dell dot um, can certainly do some things to educate the public be because of the number of roundabouts that we have coming. Uh, so that's a good comment, and we'll take that down. Next comment is, have you considered any pedestrian or bicycle overpasses? So uh, we, we haven't considered that for this project. Um, this one, uh, I guess the issue with, with pedestrian and bicycle overpasses is that it's another structure. There's a cost, uh, usually a significant cost um, associated with that. Um, and then there's usually an additional right-of-way cost associated with this. So this, this corridor is a, it's already a widening project. It already has significant right-of-way impacts uh, particularly to the south of the highway. Um, 
And then as you get past Gill's neck, it really starts to get narrow. Um, so the opportunity there for structures to, to provide um, ADA compliant ramps to get to and from those overpasses become a real um, problem to try to solve. So we haven't considered that uh, on this project. Next comment is about a large retirement community known as the Lodge of Historic Lewis being built um, on the north side of Kings Highway, just east of the Cape and Lopen High School. Um, how will this project affect access to this retirement community? So as Ed kind of mentioned, the, um, you know, we are proposing that new intersection at the BB Medical Dutchman's Harvest uh, development, which is, is um, in construction now and will also provide access to the future Mitchell Farm and Duanadale Farm development. Um, and that, you know, that's basically a full access type of intersection. It is a multi-lane roundabout, um, but everything else that's not at those roundabouts really is a right in, right out movement. So there's no left turns along the corridor, if you will. There's no left turn lanes. Um, all the movements are really accommodated at those roundabouts, which actually is, is a bit more efficient. Uh, so if you're coming, for example, to or from Atlantic Drive, you would be making rights in or rights out. And then if you're obviously at the new intersection, the new roundabout, you would be using the roundabout. This next question has to do with uh, bus stops. At the bus stops, are there pull-offs or do the buses block the slow lane? So um, Brett, do you mind taking that one on? I know that we are proposing the shelters uh, for these bus stops, but and I think we're mostly using the shoulder for these types of treatments. Yeah, like Brian said, uh, yeah, at this time we are, let me go back a slide here. Um, at, at Gill's Neck, at the Gill's Neck roundabout, we are showing additional space for bus shelters. Um, but as far as the actual bus lanes, at, at this time we are showing we aren't showing extra pull-offs for the buses. So um, you know, like here at the roundabout, they would basically just sit in the lane, or um, in some cases they would pull off into the five-foot shoulder, but they would still block the rightmost lane. Um, and, and we had discussed both both options, both have their application. But in this case, we thought, um, and actually, it, it's more preferred. Um, from a bus perspective, because it's it, it's safer. They know they don't have to pull out and then pull back in to traffic and find the gap. They're able to just stop there in traffic you know, for a short period of time and then and pull out. And um, you know we'll be in discussions about that to see if there are any places where a pullout would be warranted. Thanks, Brett. I'm um, sticking with you, Brett, for the next one. So if you could go to the Freeman split. So the question is, how does one get to Beach Plum Drive from eastbound Kings Highway? Um, so if you could just use your cursor to kind of show that movement. Yep. So Beach Plum is up here. And you'll notice our splitter island stops right around Beach Plum. So we did uh, design that such that, that the, the splitter island ends prior, prior to Beach Plum Drive. So basically, if you're heading east, you'd be in this left lane, enter the roundabout, circulate, and then exit onto Kings Highway like you're heading towards Lewis. And then you have the option then of turning into Beach Plum. And similarly, when you're leaving, you, you do have uh, access to, to either direction, um, either turning right or left. Right, we did. I did want to note we are allowing the left out of Beach Plum. So Beach Plum Drive, um, for all intents and purposes, kind of operates very similar to how it does today. Yep. All right. Next question has to do with landscaping. Um, so who maintains all the landscaping once DelDot uh, leaves? So that's a great question. Um, if, if DelDot is putting in the landscaping within the state right away or the proposed right away, uh, that DelDot would maintain it. And then typically what happens is the, it, during the life of design is we coordinate what those what that landscaping will look like. Um, and it's, you know, it's very specific to what DelDot, whatever DelDot will maintain or want to maintain going forward. Uh, if it's in an easement or if it's in um, private property that we put a TCE in for to, to, to do the work, or we coordinate with the developers that are along this corridor and they put it in, um, you know, that's kind of the conversation going forward is who does it and who maintains it. Um, we also can enter into, you know, third party agreements when it's plantings inside of the right of way, but those come with, you know, certain, you know, criteria and, you know, um, we basically want to make sure that the third party or nonprofit, a lot of times, will be able to continue with the maintenance. Um, but you know, that's that's the conversation going forward. So it, it'll probably be a mix of all of those things um, in, in the ultimate condition. But the takeaway is that we are trying to budget that corridor, trying to show that we are contemplating or, or trying to accommodate 
landscaping where it's feasible along this corridor. Okay. All right, next question is a um, question about what type of BMPs are proposed, um, linear meaning infiltration. So yes, our first plan of attack, uh, if, Brett, if you could just slide back to one of the ones that shows the infiltration. Uh, our first, our plan A, if you will, is to do infiltration um, in these stormwater uh, swales that are adjacent to the road or parallel to the road. Um, that's in line with what was you know, wished in the, in the master plan. Um, it's also, you know, from an open drainage is a, is a cleaner type of, uh, or some more simple type of a drainage approach. Um, but we do show those spots where it, our plan B, uh, where if that's not going to work, uh, where our infiltration rates are not good, uh, then we will need to do, you know, to explore other stormwater management techniques, such as wet ponds or dry ponds or things of that nature. So that's, we're trying to show both in the concept um, to be upfront uh, that, you know, it's possible that we may need to do both. Uh, that one of them might not solve everything we need. Okay, the question is, can the Lewis Lighthouse be installed in the center of the roundabout? So this would be more, you know, kind of in the same vein as trees, you know, in the roundabout or trees in the median. Um, roundabouts are inherently a safer type of intersection control. There's, there's no real debate about that, but accidents can still happen. And when they, you know, when they are, it's someone usually going right through the center of those roundabouts. Um, and we don't want something in there that can be struck, um, such as a lighthouse. Uh, so I, I would say that that's probably not something that we're considering at this moment. But we do think that the, uh, the shifting of it adjacent to the shared use path and in basically the same location as it is today is a good compromise and solution um, to having to move it, unfortunately. <clears throat> so next question is, when do we expect construction to begin and finish? So as Ed mentioned, the construction funding is, is it's funded in FY26. Um, that's really predicated on us having all the right-of-way acquired in order to start that construction. We do think it's going to take about three years total. Now that includes about a year, a year, excuse me, of utility relocations, which which we need to do in advance of the road construction. So the actual road construction is probably about two years, but I may look to Brett or Rob there to help clarify that. Yeah, yeah, that's right, Brian. Yeah, at this time, this is all an estimate at this point, since we are really in the design process, but we're looking about a year of utility relocations and two years for construction. Thank you. So the question is, um, it would be helpful if you could point out where, if anywhere, you could still turn left in this project. So I think we kind of went through that. Um, I don't know, Brett, if you want to go through. It's really kind of at the at the limits uh, where that's possible. Yeah, let me go back to the. So it was, it was, I'm sorry, the question is direct left onto King's Highway. Yeah. I'll go back to this overview display. So, so basically, it's at the major intersections where you can make um, the less. I mean, so, so starting down here, this stretch of King's Highway really isn't going to change much. So you'd still be at free access down there. But then starting at Dartmouth all the way to Freeman, the the locations where you'll be able to make direct less would be in the roundabouts. So at Dartmouth, Clay, Hills Neck, the new intersection Brian mentioned, and Freeman. So at every other side street, uh, the Bay Breeze or Standard Up East or any driveway access, um, those will be right in, right out, and you can make the lefts um, to and from the entrances via the roundabouts. Thanks, Brett. Okay, next question is, at what speed do you expect vehicles to travel through the roundabouts? So the posted speed for the corridor will be uh, 35 miles per hour, uh, but at the roundabouts, we what, what the exercise that we go through is uh, is a fastest path analysis. I don't have 
the number in front of me for all of these, but generally you want that to be, um, I think 25 or even 20 miles per hour. Brett, anything to add to that? Yeah, and that is a, a critical point in the roundabout design is, is we're trying to increase the flexion, um, which is basically kind of the, the curvature entering the roundabout. That's what really slows the speeds. Um, for single lane, that I believe we are trying to keep it at 25, I believe is the rule of thumb. And multi lanes, it is a little higher. Um, the fastest path, I think, typically you can get to 30 miles an hour. Um, however, I will say that when I say fastest path, that's kind of ignoring um, lane striping. If, if folks are actually staying within their lanes and there's a decent bit of traffic in there, they have to do that, then uh, you, you wouldn't be able to get around these roundabouts at 30 miles an hour. You're going to have to slow down. So they, Regardless, they're definitely going to have a traffic calming effect since the posted speed is 35 along the corridor. Thanks, Brett. Next question is to pro to request the landscaping be included in the roundabouts to prevent those drive-throughs uh, and for beautification. So I think that you know there are there are certain I think limitations that we would um, be interested in. This is a lot of the conversation going on at some of the under roundabouts in the Lewis area, such as at Minus Conaway and Old Orchard Road. Um, about what can go inside of there, and a lot of it has to do with you know what height would they grow to a lot of the maintenance um, associated with it. But I, I think that that's probably another area for collaboration. Okay, next question is, let's see if I can follow this here. So Kings Highway to southbound SR1 uh, eliminated, requiring additional load at Dartmouth to, south, to southbound one. So, I guess um, it may be helpful to just go through specifically what we're doing here with all of the movements. Um, all the movements that are there today are still accommodated. Um, Brett, if you wanna chime in on, I, I guess the specific movement of westbound Kings to southbound SR1, or I guess any direction on Kings to southbound SR1 and how that movement is made. Right, yes. I mean, it basically will function pretty similar to the way it is. By the time you get to this project limit here, um, you, you still have all the lanes available. So basically, these, these two lanes coming in, if you're in the leftmost lane, you, you automatically be in a turn lane. Uh, actually, actually, in both lanes, you automatically be in a turn lane since this is a triple left, and then just make the left on SR1. Um, and then similarly, if you were coming up from, uh, say, the, the southern part of Kings Highway, you just enter the roundabout, circulate around and then enter onto Dartmouth, and then you'd be able to make, make that left on SR1 as well. Thanks, Brett. Next one is how does a, a, a biker, I'm gonna assume it's bicyclists, uh, leaving Bay Breeze travel west on Kings Highway. So if we could flip over to the last intersection. So from a bicycle standpoint, the path that you would, would take, I mean, if you if you wanted to remain on the same side of the road, you could travel west on the shared use path. But I think the intention of that question is to be on the other side of Kings. Uh, and, and what you would do is use the shared use path. If you can follow Brett's cursor down to the crosswalk there, cross, and then cross again. And then you would be on your shared use path heading west. A question about what about the Monroe Avenue crossover on Freeman Highway? So um, our limits really end right here where you can see um, the end of the improvements there just past the roundabout on Freeman. Uh, Monroe Avenue, I believe, has a subdivision coming um, that has a proposed traffic signal associated with it. We haven't entered into any coordination specifically on how that would function um, with our project, but we do we have modeled our project, um, and I guess um, Robert, Brett, or Ed, anything to add there? I mean, I think that our confidence level is, is good on what we have proposed here, uh, even with the presence of a signal at Monroe. Yeah, we, we've definitely considered the signal Monroe, and I don't really have any concerns for um, you know, potential backups into the roundabout or, or anything that the roundabout would interfere with the signal. So. Um, should be able to accommodate that as well. 
Next question, Brett, if you could hang on. What was the projected AADT for, for US-9? I'm going to say that, that you mean King's Highway by that, that this project was designed for. So the design year was for 2050. Um, and I don't know if we have the AADT numbers on hand, but I will look yeah, at uh, for that. I'm looking at, I believe it, it's right around 1800 for the design year 2050. Thank you. Or I'm sorry, it's sorry, 18,000. Next question is the drainage swales um, that parallel Kings Highway could take up space that could be made available for planting of trees and foliage that will soften the views of the gateway to Lewis. Underground drainage would add significantly to the appearance of the project. Um, so again, this is a uh, conceptual. This is where we are currently. Some of the things that we will continue to look at are where we can provide landscaping. Uh, a lot of that, you know, the infiltration stormwater management approach is really predicated upon having good infiltration rates, which we don't have back there. Uh, we've done the testing, but I think we're, um, or we've done the borings, but we're, we're currently doing the testing to see if they'll be um, good for design. Um, but that's probably an area where we're gonna have to continually, you know, to collaborate with, uh, with the byways group on, you know, what, what type of landscaping can we achieve and are we still meeting the goals of the project? But good question. Next question has to do with street lighting. Uh, is there any opportunity for continuous uh, well-designed units in the median or the edge of the right-of-way? So um, our project will include lighting. Uh, we do have utility poles on the, on the north side of Kings Highway for the most part, uh, but the project will include uh, street lighting um, similar to all of our Del Dot projects. We will have to follow up about the question about the median. Um, I don't know that I have that answer for you now. I don't know if Rob or Brett or Ed want to chime in on that one. That, that is something we're considering and we're working out the details on, you know, all locations and where that's going to occur. Like Brian said, it will definitely be having lighting along the corridor, um, particularly with the roundabouts. Uh, the next question has to do with, uh, to please address how the traffic circles will function uh, when King's Highway backs up. So as, as Brett mentioned, we did, we did, project the traffic out to 2050 and did try to uh, accommodate all of uh, or take into account all of the proposed development that is coming um, in that traffic analyses. And we did compare, as Ed noted, you know, roundabouts versus signals at, at every one of these. Um, and if you, if you really look at the Dartmouth Drive intersection, that one kind of screams geometrically that it, 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 that it should be a roundabout. Um, and so does this one at Freeman. So from there, we, we kind of tried to see, you know, can roundabouts work um, from a level of service perspective at the rest of these. Um, a lot of the key analysis had to do with Gills Neck Road and the new intersection at BB um, and Zwanendale. And we didn't think it was right to have one be a signal and one be a roundabout. So we analyzed it signal and signal versus roundabout and roundabout and the, and the level of service and the queuing, the delays that we see are better. Uh, associated with the double roundabout options and, and basically roundabouts as a whole. Um, so hope that answers that question. Next question is, it looks like the right-of-way goes through some of the properties. Uh, what happens with that? How long will temporary construction right-of-way uh, be in place before and after the project is complete? So uh, I guess that's kind of a two-parter there. Um, so. We do have to acquire right away to build this project. Um, temporary construction easements are really just that. It's it's just uh, access basically to uh, to do work temporarily right there. The property remains the property owners, um, and and um, so that wouldn't remain Dell Dots uh, or the state of Delaware's after the project leaves. But anything purchased in fee uh, or in permanent easement, you know, we would retain the rights to enter upon that and. And that's what our real estate team is for. They handle those, those kinds of uh, negotiations once we get to that phase of the project, which we're still, we are targeting at the end of this year to answer that part. Uh, next question is, are these slides on Dell Dot's website yet? So they are not up there yet, but they will be this week. Uh, so we typically typically like to have the workshop and then everything that we present tonight is uploaded onto the project website.
Question is, will you be adding more travel miles and traffic to the westernmost roundabout? It's all cars traveling east that want to turn into the brush factory or Mr. P's uh, strip. Brett, if you could go through that, um, I guess the access, like how the access will be maintained right there. Yeah, so as far as access to, you know, to this area here, the brush factory, um, once again, not being located at one of the roundabouts, anyone wishing to access these locations would have to use the adjacent roundabouts. So um, you know, coming out of the brush factory, if you wanted to head east to the right of the page, you would actually turn right out and use the roundabout to circulate around. And then similarly, if you were heading east and wanting to access the brush factory, you would head onto the next sheet to the Freeman roundabout. intersection, circulate the roundabout, and then come back around heading westbound to be able to access. So hopefully that answers the question. Next one is waiting to turn left into Beach Plum Drive uh, across oncoming traffic is a bad rear end accident waiting to happen. Um, so, you know, again, that, that kind of uh, condition is, is really unchanged uh, from today. I guess the thought is that with the presence of the roundabout, the, um, the waiting to turn shouldn't be as much of an issue because the, the westbound movements on Kings are, are pretty much free flow. Um, uh, but it's something that we can continue to look at, the, 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 the miniature queuing inside of the, uh, the exit of the roundabout, if you will. So good question. Can you provide more details on the Bay Breeze entrance and how it impacts with the apartment owners? So um, the Bay Breeze Drive that you see there just to the left of this screen, um, this was another real key into the choosing of roundabouts. Um, the, the associated queuing and, and the delay of anyone wanting to turn left out of Bay, Bay Breeze Drive in the design year of 2050 was outrageous. I mean, it was nearly impossible to make that movement due to the amount of traffic. Um, so it really lent itself to the roundabout decision for them to basically be able to make a U-turn by just turning right. Um, but the, the actual improvements are really just a repaving of that intersection um, and converting it to the right in, right out, which is a similar treatment to the rest of the corridor. Next one is at the high school roundabout, will there be traffic flow restriction systems to avoid high school outbound traffic flow from overwhelming the roundabout and stopping eastbound traffic from entering the roundabout? So um, Brett, I don't know if you wanna to try to take this one. I mean, the uh, platooning effect, you know, is not something that you can specifically design for all the time. It's certainly one of the arguments that can be made with a signal because you can devote more green time to a specific movement but I don't know how, you know, how maybe that was modeled in this in this level of service analysis we did. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's definitely going to be times um, when one leg, you know, might dominate. Um, and you know, obviously, depending upon the configuration and where folks are coming from, um, it can determine, you know, who's going to be somewhat restricted. So, you know, if if there is a heavy um, left movement in this direction, that that would the the outcoming school traffic would have the right of way compared to eastbound Kings. Um, however, I, I believe a, a lot of the, the movement is to the west, so they would um, just be making this right turn, not really blocking any additional traffic, um, and they would basically be looking for gaps um, in the westbound traffic that's heading through. So, um, yeah, hopefully that answers the question. We, we do look at, at these roundabouts um, you know, from a delay perspective and, and the relative traffic volumes for the, the main line, in this case being Kings Highway and the side streets, if, if it is, uh, if, if, there's, if there's an overwhelming differential between the two, um, that can lend you away from roundabouts. Um, but we didn't find that to be the case for any of these intersections. So uh, we did you know, consider roundabouts to be viable solutions given the traffic volumes. Thanks, Brett. Uh, next question is, will there be a sidewalk? And if so, where will it be? So. Um, when we say shared use path, that's to accommodate sidewalk and bicyclists. 
Um, you know, one of the key things that we're trying to be cognizant of in this project is is the very you know vibrant uh, trail network that we have in Lewis. Uh, to trying to really accommodate both of the users of of that, really all three, the the pedestrian uh, and both of the you know type A and type you know, type A cyclist who is who, who wants to go fast and, and you know be in that that shoulder that we've provided, um, and then the more recreational type of cyclist that that the shared use path is there for. Um, so there is sidewalk, but it's just it's wider, and we call it a shared use path, and it, it runs along both sides of the road the entire length of the corridor. Next question is: Can the utilities be buried rather than aerial through this project? So. Um, that is something that we can look at. Um, typically, I mean, there are other utilities, you know, such as you know, sewer, water, gas, um, and communications that will be buried uh, throughout the project. Um, I think that usually the first plan of uh, attack on the aerial utilities is to keep them aerial. It's just, um, you know, it's, it's more cost effective, basically. Um, going underground can be very costly, and sometimes it's a cost that the department has to, has to um, shoulder. Um, so, but we can look at that. Um, there are times on many other projects where we need to consider that for various reasons. So that'll be part of the project development process. Next question is, since the sidewalk appears to be between the access road and the regular travel lanes near the Freeman and Kings roundabout, do you anticipate that crosswalks will be added on the access road to provide pedestrian access to those businesses. So I don't know if we can zoom in uh, at all. So the access road is really kind of like a, a driveway, if you will. Um, we can certainly look at you know the the pedestrian and cyclist connections, um, you know, to the destinations here. But I don't know if we would be putting in crosswalks per se uh, at any of these, but something that we can look at. Ed, yeah, anything to, to that or, or Brett? Yeah, yeah I, I would agree, Brian. I mean, it, it is, you know, fairly low volume. It is essentially, a, you know, a combined driveway for several businesses. Um, I think a, a connection could be considered um, you know, potentially to the access road, but as far as like striped crosswalks, probably just wouldn't be warranted in this case. Okay. Uh, one more question about uh, Beach Plum Drive. So for those waiting to turn left into Beach Plum Drive could could back up into the roundabout. Yeah, so uh, again, I think that that's something that we can look at, like, you know, our anticipated queuing, if you will, in the peak hours about what that is right there in the little exit out of the roundabout and just, you know, for a level of confidence in that, but that's a good question. Thanks. Can we discuss the access road in front of Caldwell Banker? Um, do they need sidewalks there as well? So we, I mean, there there is sidewalk on the, you know, on the uh, south side, if you will, of, uh, yeah, that, if you can follow the cursor there, that, that will provide, um, you know, we can look at shifting that or providing connections to and from, you know, kind of in line with the crosswalk question, something we can continue to evaluate. If, uh... Is it correct that the area at Clay Road, which has been purchased to remain green, will become a retention pond? Uh, so again, this was shown at a conceptual level, um, basically as a plan B. Um, we did learn in some some of our conversations with the byways group that there may be a desire to to use that in conjunction with the preservation as a stormwater management technique. That's not anything that we have uh, coordinated to date, um, but it is something that we probably will, um, if, if especially if our infiltration plan uh, doesn't work out. Um, but I, it could be an area for collaboration that makes all the parties um, happy. Okay, another question about Bay Breeze. Um, if traveling south on Kings Highway, residents would have to go to the next roundabout and come back north uh, to get in. When the ferry lets out and there's heavy traffic, uh, it will take an unacceptable amount of time to get home. Is that correct? So 
Um, let me see if I've got, you know, I don't know, Brett, if you've got the specific movement that you can show with the cursor. If you're traveling south, so um, I guess we're getting our directions a little bit. I'm, south is technically correct. I've been calling it westbound. Um, I just think of the ocean as towards the east. Um, but if you're traveling south and you want to go onto Bay Breeze, yes, you would be using the next roundabout down at, which is the new one at BB and Mitchell Farm to make that U-turn movement. Next one is what research uh, can you share about five roundabouts so close to each other and the safety and the driving experience? Uh, this is only a couple of miles and five roundabouts seems excessive. So um, Brett, sorry to keep coming back to you, but I, I guess, you know, really leaning on, you know, we've, the project team has really spent the last year kind of doing a, a, a lot of data collection, the field survey, traffic counts and traffic uh, analysis and projections to kind of see what can we deliver out here that's in line with the master plan? What do we need to do? Because we know uh, of the obvious capacity issues that are coming uh, or, that, or that already exist for that matter. And you know, one of the key parts of that analysis has to do with the major intersections. Do they remain signals? Do they remain unsignalized? Uh, or should they be roundabouts? And everything that our analysis is showing us is that this will work. Uh, at an acceptable level. Um, so I don't know, Brett, if you could dig a little deeper there, but that's the takeaway. Yeah, yeah. I mean, honestly, it's the, the roundabouts kind of um, in conjunction with one another work pretty harmoniously. Um, it, it's when you start introducing signals in close proximity where you might start to have some issues, things, you know, signals backing up, say when the, tra the ferry lets out, backing up in some of the roundabouts um, by, you know, Going with the roundabout concept, it generally keeps traffic just free flowing um, and moving at all times. You know, it removes, you know, during the middle of the day when there might not be that much traffic, um, you know, you'll pretty much just be able to go with no delay. Um, but yeah, really, you know, looking at it from a corridor perspective, being able to, to get everything to a roundabout um, actually works to our benefit as far as operations along the corridor. Thank you. Uh, hang on for the next one too. So what what accommodation have you made for the traffic coming off of the ferries in each summer? So I could tell you that the analysis that we did was basically based on the worst 15 minute period on the worst day in the summer to try to analyze what is that going to do to these roundabouts um, to try to figure out what would happen in that scenario. So Brett, if you want to expand on that. Yes. Yeah, so, so we did, we, we did, we did some counts and some, um, site evaluations, looking at the traffic volumes when the ferry lets out, and obviously it does back up um, along the corridor. So we, we did a bit of a, a sensitivity analysis to see what would happen um, towards the end of the design year, because it, it does, like Brian said, if you consider the worst 15 minute period in the summer on a Saturday when, you know, basically traffic is at its max, um, things will be heavy. I mean, there's really no, no way around that. Um, but, you know, looking prior to that, even just a few years prior, um, the design that we have is able to accommodate those volumes and at any other point in the year um, when, you, when you don't have the maximum summer traffic, um, the corridor functions well, um, you know, really to, to be able to fully accommodate, um, you know, the worst amount of traffic in the design year, you'd be looking at even more lanes, which I don't think is something we want to be looking at. Um, you know, we have to be kind of reasonable um, with what, what type of volumes we're designing to. So we did consider the ferry traffic and, and evaluated to see what effect it would have. Um, but then we we sort of we have other traffic volumes that we use for our our actual design. Hey Brian, real quick, while well, well, we're on this slide, um, I wanted to touch on something. Um, I received a question, uh, and I'm not sure if everyone is um, is seeing what we see. So um, some of the questions that Brian is uh, seeing on the open tab of Zoom. Um, He's, those are the questions that Brian is addressing. And what me and the other panelists have been doing is any questions that can be, um, that we can just provide an answer by typing, we are doing so. And so what's, what's happening is Zoom is moving a question that we've provided a written response to, moving it to the answers tab. Um, so if there's a question that Brian didn't read that you feel like got skipped, just know that you haven't been, is just look at the answers tab 
um, on the question on the Q and A uh, page, uh, you might be able to find your answer there. Um, so I'll address the one that the person who brought this up now. Um, Zeke, you had a question about uh, uh, the right of way um, of your property or your business located between Coldwell Banker and the Aquamarine business. Uh, you asked if you will be losing any of your property to the right of way acquisitions, and um, my response was that in this segment, um, so where you see the access road, that is existing Kings Highway. Um, that's where Kings Highway is currently. So since Kings Highway is essentially shifting to the east uh, or south, um, we don't anticipate needing right of way from those businesses on the top of the page. However, we might need some uh, temporary construction easement for construction, um, but that's, that's the information that we have at this time. Um, so if, um, if you have any other questions, feel free to, to send another one. Uh, but like I said, uh, anybody else out there who um, uh, thinks that we've skipped your questions, just uh, if you would just check the answers tab, You're, we might have answered your question there. Thank you. Thanks, Ed. Uh, next question is, have you considered leaving the intersection at the high school a signalized one? Um, four roundabouts in such a short distance will be uh, amazingly annoying. I think the student and bus traffic will appreciate having signal, especially when the ferry traffic hits Kings Highway. So we did um, consider leaving it a signalized intersection. Uh, again, the key, the key point in the analysis had to do with the, with the new intersection at BB and Zwanendale. Um, and how that would function with this one. So um, basically the analysis that, that we did showed that two roundabouts work better than two signals or one signal and one roundabout at either one. Um, Ed, do you have anything you wanna add on to that or, or Brett, you know, as part of the analysis there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, pretty much the gist of it. Um, yeah, we, we definitely looked at these two in, in concert with one another because they are in such close proximity. Um, and like Brian said, operationally, the roundabouts work better. And then, um, as always, from a safety perspective, um, you know, I, I understand the, the familiarity with, with signals, but roundabouts are definitely a safer um, intersection design, particularly with the, uh, the types of, when, when crashes do occur uh, with roundabouts, they're much lower severity when you're dealing with signals and as has been mentioned, inexperienced drivers, potentially at the high school, um, the signals tend to result in more uh, angle crashes or head on, um, which can be much higher severity with, with the uh, roundabouts, you end up with more rear end or side swipe collisions, which um, you know, reduce the number of serious injuries and fatalities. So that's um, another major benefit for these roundabouts. Uh, next one is why not replace the Dartmouth and SR1 intersection with a with a gigantic roundabout. Uh, so that I guess just right off the top would be I think out of the scope of this project. We are looking at the specific left turning movements onto Dartmouth um, from SR1 as as being a potential add um, to the project, but rebuilding the the SR1 intersection uh, is not currently part of this project. Next one is, have any of these concepts been reviewed with the city of Lewis? Uh, would the city be able to comment and discuss with DelDOT? Um, so yes, we have had a few meetings. We, we had a couple of meetings in the ramp up to this workshop with uh, elected officials um, as, and city of Lewis, Sussex County, and the stakeholders for the master plan to kind of um, get their feedback um, and to discuss. Um, so so they, I guess general answer is, general answer is yes. Um, but, and of course we would, uh, love to uh, have more comments and discuss it further uh, with them going forward. Uh, next one, I'm gonna look to you, Brett. So what this is, we have a lot of questions just related to level of service. Um, so I may, if we could, if you could pull up or at least speak to, you know, our projected level of service at all of these roundabouts, it may actually knock out a few of these questions. So the, the question specifically is what is the, projected maximum vehicle trips that this plan can accommodate on a weekday and then also on a summer uh, weekend. Um, so if you can kind of speak to our approach and what we're seeing in, in our 2050 design year for level, for level of service 
I think that actually would knock out a few of the other questions that we have as well. Sure, yeah, and, and we're looking, you know, primarily at, at the intersections is where you're going to have, you know, the bottlenecks, um, the, you know, the, the four lanes, uh, two lanes in each direction just along the corridor is, is plenty for, um, for the traffic volumes that we'd be expecting on Kings. But um, at the intersections, we're, we're looking at the, the summer 2050 volumes is our design year. Um, and I can yeah, get some, some level of service information at... At Dartmouth Drive, uh, under our, configure, our current configuration, we would be looking at a level of service A. There really is very little traffic. Um, and, but most of the traffic is using the bypass lane, so they're given uh, free movement. So the, the delay is quite small here at Dartmouth. Uh, Clay, the multi-lane roundabout option is also level of service, service A, um, since there isn't, really isn't that much side street traffic, um, particularly with this leg yet. We did accommodate a second um, lane here. Um, for potential uh, development, um, that which will continue to be coordinated uh, in design. Um, here for Gills Neck, uh, the level of service will be a level of service C um, with about 18 seconds of, of total delay. It, it, the, um, the, the volumes on this one with the side street with Gills Neck are, are probably the, the highest compared to uh, many of the other side streets. Um, so a, a signal was was similarly on a level of service C, um, but the, but the delay worked a lot better. The, the delay number is much lower for Gills Neck um, with the roundabout option compared to the signal. Um, for the new intersection here, um, we're looking at the inter, uh, intersection level of service C as well. And then finally for uh, Freeman Highway, excuse me, uh, level of service A as well. Um, and then we definitely needed this second lane to push the westbound or southbound traffic through, um, which then continues into the two lane um, section continuing. And then in the eastbound direction, they, they, there's a split. The, the heaviest movement is definitely this bypass lane. So they're once again given a free movement. And then um, this lane then would have the right of way to then just continue right into Kings Highway. Um, so it, it, once again, but by adding this second lane here, really improved our level of service by having some additional capacity that we could push through the roundabout in this um, west or, or south direction. Hopefully that answers some of the uh, level of service questions. I think it did. I'm going to see if you can go one step further. Um, mm -hmm. Any queuing, so we have a question about queuing. Uh, in the modeling of queuing into the roundabouts, how often will there be vehicles set up or waiting to enter the roundabout? So um, I, I think that that's more of a level of service type of question. Uh, the, I mean, level of service is directly related to delay. Um, so I think what you just said kind of answers that question. Um, I don't know if you want to expand on that just specifically. Yeah, yeah. Typically with level of service, we're, we're looking at, we're kind of quantifying it in, in delay numbers. Um, so like I said, in, in anything LOS um, C or less, you're talking about, um, you know, like like 25 seconds or less of, of total delay for the, for the intersection. So, um, yeah, as far I, I couldn't convert, I could not convert that right now to, to a queue length. Um, I have to look into the modeling a little bit more for that. But um, sh uh, the short story is that the um, you know the, the delay compared to the signals is um, less for the roundabouts, and it's within a, an acceptable range for intersection design. Okay, next question we have is, uh, can you show me Kings Highway by the high school? So if you could flip back to the slide at Gill's Neck and just leave it on here. Um, so for the, you know, anyone who missed it, this presentation is being recorded and also the slides that we presented tonight um, will be up on our project website this week. So you're free to download that and share it and look at it and uh, use that to provide us any of your comments or to just use it, uh, but it will be up there this week. Okay, we have, uh, I think, a follow-up. So the previous question that had to do with the Dartmouth Drive uh, roundabout, so um, had to do with, it currently has two left turn lanes to southbound SR1. At, I think it was back at the other one, Brett. So I think maybe it's just the, the, yeah, the, the through arrow is shown there. Um, 
in our concept, if you want to just zoom in on the actual Dartmouth leg. So to clarify, the um, our improvements kind of stop halfway down Dartmouth, you know, from that intersection to SR1, uh, at least at this point. And uh, you know, if we we determine we need to go further for the uh, for the left turns from SR1 on the Dartmouth, then we may at least repave Dartmouth. But that that's kind of a minor add at this point. But we are still keeping the lane configurations at SR1 the same. So you know, maybe that's something that we can update in our concept uh, to kind of show that left turn, um, you know, direction uh, it, instead of the through movement coming out of the roundabouts. Uh, so that desired lane is still to be, you know, for the left turns. Hope that answers the question. If not, you know, please type another one and, and we'll do our best to answer. Uh, next question is, uh, won't pedestrian crossovers at the roundabouts cause major problems or delays for the cars using the roundabout. I don't understand how the crossovers will be managed. Um, so this is a bit of a new thing for Del Dot as far as what we're doing for treatments at multi-lane roundabouts. We don't, first of all, we don't have a lot of multi-lane roundabouts in the state. We do have one proposed at Plantation Road, which will be you know, in construction in the next year and open by the time that this really moves to construction. So there will be some familiarity with how to, how to navigate uh, multi-lane roundabouts, but um, the crossing, the pedestrian and cyclist type crossing of those roundabouts is something that's uh, sort of new for Delaware here. What we're what we're proposing with this project is to use the uh, rectangular rapid flashing beacons, the RRFBs uh, that you see up and down kind of the Forgotten Mile into um, you know to Dewey Beach, to Bethany Beach, and and uh, Point South. Really, it's uh, it's activated when someone presses the button. Um, so that's the treatment that we're proposing here. Um, I, the thought is, you know, we are aiming to have that boulevard type of a feel to Kings Highway uh, with this project. The speeds are intended to be lower um, and we're already kind of employing them on SR1. So the thought is that we think we can do it here too. Um, but that is, that is a new thing as far as how it relates to round multi-lane roundabouts and the pedestrian crossings, but that's how they are proposed to work. I would just throw in there too, Brian, just to clarify the, the, the beacons. It's not like a red light where when it's activated, traffic would need right. to be stopped the entire time. You know, once pedestrians are clear, you know, you're free to go. It's more of just kind of a, an additional warning device. Thanks for that, Brett. Um, next question we have is how will this affect campers getting into the state park and tractor trailers for business deliveries? So <clears throat> two parts there, I guess. I, I don't know that it really affects anything for the campers. Uh, trying to get to to Cape and Lopen, um, they would the roundabouts are designed to accommodate larger vehicles. That's really what the inside apron is for. It's there to be driven over for the large larger vehicles, um, and and so that's the answer really for the delivery trucks as well. Um, certainly, passenger cars and just everyday users are going to use the through lane and the circulatory path, but the um, the kind of if you want to zoom in, Brett, there just on the on the roundabout itself. Um, the kind of tan colored uh, circle that his cursor is going around. That is for larger trucks uh, and larger vehicles. <clears throat> Next question is, will we see interim improvements to existing Kings Highway and Gills Neck Road uh, necessary prior to 2026, <clears throat> excuse me, due to significant development? Um, i.e. Dual left, dual left from Gills Neck, use of shoulders on Kings to the high school to Clay Road or other locations along the corridor. So I would say that that is not something that this project team um, would do. Like we, we are presenting on this project. That's something that is uh, coordinated uh, with our development coordination section as developments come in, <clears throat> excuse me. And those are certainly, those conversations are certainly ongoing. Um, so, you know, several large developments are proposed along this corridor. So, you know, the topic of interim improvements or, or what happens from now until when the capital project comes online are, are always points of conversation. Uh, and our project team is always usually in the loop um, with our development coordination folks. They do a great job of including us uh, when they do, when we do have a capital project uh, in their area. Uh, and that's certainly the case here. So there's a lot of good collaboration going on.
how are pedestrians and or bikers supposed to get to the businesses on the access roads without a crosswalk? Would you cross an access road without a crosswalk? So that's a good question. Uh, I think it's something that our project team can can continue to look at. Um, uh, so, you know, we don't want to put, we don't typically put crosswalks everywhere, um, but in certain spots, they are appropriate. So I think that that's something that the project team can take back. Certainly got a lot of questions tonight about that. And, and we can look at that. <clears throat> Next one is from Baybreeze Drive to the roundabout. You would need to cross over the lane that continues straight on Freeman uh, during peak times and with no traffic pulsing due to the current light at Gills Neck, this may need attention. So I think, let me see if I'm following here. From Baybreeze to get into the roundabout. Oh, I was thinking, um, sorry, Beach Plum Drive. So from Bay Breeze, if you wanted to continue onto Freeman, you shouldn't need to cross any lanes. So you would you would use the bypass lane that we have here. If you want to use your cursor there, Brett, to show that that movement. So you would approach the roundabout, but then you would stay to the right and use that bypass lane to just continue. <coughs> excuse me, onto Freeman. Brian, I think I think the question was maybe also um, if, if you're trying to exit Bay Breeze to get into the roundabout to head to oh, gotcha. west south. You, yeah. So to, to answer the question, yes, you would need to cross this lane that continues onto the bypass um, and get over into the left lane so you could enter the roundabout. Um, and you know, there I think the other comment was with the removal of the signal, um, the loss of gaps uh, to be able to get out into traffic. So that. There, there is a, and we can get into some of the, the platooning effects of all this, but you know, basically with with the roundabouts um, being or the signals being replaced with roundabouts, the the, the traffic stream, you're not going to have the extremely large gaps, um, but the gaps will be more frequent, you know, maybe smaller, but they but more frequent in nature. Um, so there will still be opportunity to get into that left lane, and the you know the alternative, you know, being a, a left out, as Brian mentioned before, you know, we we did look at. The design of your volumes and it, it will be nearly impossible to to make the left out so we, st we do believe this is the the best option to uh, maintain access to and from babies thanks for that clarification brett next one coming in is if roundabouts are so effective uh, why not use one at the proposed monroe avenue and freeman highway intersection instead of the traffic light so um so that i guess kind of two parts to there so freeman highway is not is not Del Dot uh, owned and maintained. It is DRBA. Um, however, I think Monroe Avenue that that development coming in <clears throat> is being reviewed by our, our subdivision section. I could be wrong about that, um, but we don't. Uh, that is typically something that comes out through the through the process of that is whether it would need to be a traffic light. I don't know if they've considered a roundabout, but um, you know we can certainly talk to that group uh, if there's still coordination left to be done. Have you accounted for possible increased traffic on Clay Road as a result of the improvements at West Coast Corner and Old Orchard Road? Um, so we have, I guess that, I don't know, Brett, do you want to kind of want to take that one on? Yeah, so, so I mean, I can't get into all the details, but the basically what we do look for, as far as the traffic projections go, it is a regional model and we're considering development um, in the areas we, we look at, you know, what type of, what type of development is anticipated um, to project the traffic growth. So I, I, I think the short answer would be yes, we do consider, you know, all the development that's going on and then project that um, at a growth rate to the design year. All right, thanks. We, um, let's see, we've got, we had one that I wanted to address. There are there any changes down by the end of at Community Bank, our sidewalk changes. So um, one of the early slides that we showed showed a we tried to show the entire corridor of Kings Highway, but this actual section is being done under a separate Dell dot project. Um, so the only improvements as part of this project 
uh, that we're really making are on that other side of Kings Highway across from Community Bank where the cursor is. And that's to really connect that shared use path um, to have it be continuous along the whole way. The, the other Dell Dot project, which is really uh, born out of some of the um, accidents that we've seen from a pedestrian and bicycle standpoint at this intersection, we'll, we'll tighten up that intersection and uh, basically make that right turn a little bit more abrupt uh, to slow the traffic down. And the only real sidewalk improvements or construction are, are where the crosswalk comes in today on the community bank side. So no real change there uh, from that perspective. Next one is, does Delaware DMV code need to be improved regarding traffic flow laws, including yielding to traffic, tailgating, et cetera? And there's a clarification I should have asked regarding traffic flow laws pertaining to roundabouts, including yielding, tailgating. So, uh, you know, I, I am unaware of, of what the code actually uh, says, DMV code, you know, to be completely honest, but um, I, uh, maybe that's a question that we could take offline uh, to, I, I think that, the education effort on roundabouts is uh, an ongoing thing that that Del Dot is striving to do better at. I think we do a pretty good job at it, um, and certainly all of the roundabouts that are coming online, you know, in the next few years, certainly in the Lewis area, will help with that as well as more people become more familiar with them. Um, <clears throat> so, hope that answers that question. Next one is uh, that I would definitely recommend crosswalks at any driveways connecting to this corridor. Del Dot always requires them for commercial projects on Del Dot roadways and given the amount of bicycle traffic and pedestrian traffic in this area, they should be warranted, possibly even with stop signs and sight distance calculated for safety. So great question or a great comment really. I think um, that's something that the project team has learned tonight that there is uh, you know, an interest in that, particularly with the access road questions. And then, um, you know, again, our goal here is to provide some good, safe connectivity to, to the great trail network that we have in this area. So we wanna make sure that we're doing right by the community. So we'll take that back and we'll start looking at things like that. So appreciate it, thank you. And there are no more open questions. Um, so, We'll hang on, of course, uh, for a few more minutes as questions uh, may still trickle in. <clears throat> this was good participation tonight um, from speaking for the project team. We really appreciate it. And uh, we're looking forward to the feedback to come. So we'll hang on here, uh, project team. I'm gonna mute myself and go off video unless we get some more uh, questions, uh, but we'll hang on here for a few more minutes. And please feel free to chime in if you've got anything else. Thank you. Okay, we've got a few more that have come in since. Um, the question is, is there going to be a bike lane on Kings Highway? So two parts to that answer. Um, there is a, a shared use path proposed on both sides of Kings Highway. That is, that's there for pedestrians uh, who wanna walk and then also for anyone who wants to use a bicycle. Uh, and then we also have a five foot continuous shoulder, uh, the entire length of the corridor that's also there and can be used uh, by bicyclists. So uh, yes and yes. Could the bicycle lanes along Freeman Highway, uh, the roundabout at Freeman Highway by Colder Banger be on the other side of the green oval areas? Could we go to that um, intersection, Brett? see. So I'm not sure if I follow exactly um, bicycle lanes along the along this roundabout. So we've got we've got the shared use path on both sides that's uh, connected by the pedestrian crossings and the, uh, the crosswalks, excuse me. And then we've got the shoulder as well, at least on the outside uh, the bypass lane there going east and then where Brett's cursor just was going west. We don't typically 
uh, stripe or provide the width inside of the roundabouts for a shoulder in the roundabout. Um, that's just not usually something that's done. Um, so I think that we are doing that based on your question, but if, uh, if I missed it, please follow up and I'll do my best to answer it. Uh, we have a question from uh, Senator Lopez. Uh, so nice to hear from you, Senator. Um, the question is, will there be an in-person workshop uh, in the near future to bring this back out in front of uh, all the constituents? And, and if so, when do we think we'll do that? So Delta in general is still sticking to our virtual uh, platform. I think the hope for all of us is that we'll be out of that you know, uh, soon and back to having in-person workshops, certainly for something like this with a lot of community interest, uh, we would prefer to have that be in person where we can all attack you know, or all talk to you um, from our project team and to answer your questions because we know that you have a lot, a lot of them. Um, so I don't know what the specific answer to that is. Um, Del Dot is is getting in the better habit of having more public workshops as projects get closer to construction to kind of let the public know, you know, here's here's what you're going to see, here's where the detours are going to go, here's how long they're going to be, here's where you're going to get in and out of your driveway. Um, more specific type of uh, um, of a presentation. And I think hopefully by that point, we're all back in person. Um, so TBD, I think, Senator, but I think the hope is here um, from the project team that we get to get out and you know, back in front of people to talk about this. Okay, I think we have a, a follow-up on the on that shared use path question. So on the north side, shared use path by the access road. <clears throat> so moving that closer to the access road, I guess. I don't know, Brett, if you want to comment on that, on what our uh, you know, our flexibility is here in this area. Yeah, um, it's certainly a, a a viable suggestions and definitely something we'll look into. Um, I'll just say, you know, we do have the, the bus stop here and, and the bike slip ramp that, that need to access, you know, it, it, the, the bus stop does have some flexibility probably that we could move it, but the bike slip ramp generally, you want that to be right as you're exiting the roundabout. So there's some design considerations we'd have to look at, but I would say that's, that is definitely something we can consider is moving this shared use path potentially closer to the access road and away from, from King's traffic. Thanks, Brett. Next one we have is for bikers using the shoulder, they will need to cross over the bypass lane to get into the roundabout. Having ridden several of them in the area, this is dangerous, especially with the big traffic volume. So what we also have here that we, I don't know if we pointed out specifically. So um, if you could back up to um, one of the round, yeah, this one. So what we have is kind of like these little um, exits, if you will, for bi bicyclists that are in the shoulder and wish to exit to not have to negotiate traffic inside of the roundabout. So if you followed Brett's cursor there, you would use the little, um, it's kind of at a 45 degree angle there to connect to that shared use path because you know we agree that cyclists are, are better served to not be inside of that roundabout at the same time with the cars, um, at least in the, in the circulatory path. It's certainly their right to do so. Uh, but we are trying to provide um, access for them uh, to get out of there. And then the last one that we have is, is do we have a projected cost of the project? Ed, do you have what we have in the current CTP? If not, I can look it up. Yeah, let me look it up.
So we show 23 million for construction. Thanks, Ed. Mm -hmm. Next one is, will there be signage for the cyclists to know the roundabout is coming up and that the shared use path is the safer area to be in? So that's a good question. I don't know that we have specific signage for like exits for cyclists uh, approaching the, the uh, roundabout. Certainly don't want to dominate the, uh, the visual you know, um, space for drivers because we will have signs for the for motorists approaching the roundabout to, um, you know, there is a little bit of a choose your lane type of aspect to these multi-lane roundabouts. Uh, so there will be some of that in addition to the, the lane markings. Um, but I would have to go back and research. We, we've started to do this on some other projects, not just with roundabouts, but with the signalized intersections as well. Um, typically they have some type of a uh, apron um, similar to, to Head connections or curb ramps to let um, you know to let you know you've exited the roadway or are entering the roadway or shoulder. Um, they have those here too, um, but we could follow up on that. I don't know if Brett or Rob or Ed, you have anything that you can help answer that question? Yeah, yeah, like Brian said, we will have to look into it a little bit. I know we are. Uh, there is at a minimum some signage letting you know that the bike lane is ending when you're uh, approaching the roundabout. And that's just prior to then those uh, bike slip ramps that we had um, uh, displayed on the screen. Um, so it, it, there is some signs let, letting bikers know that that it is ending. Um, and, and like Brian said, we, we can look into it a little more, see if we can provide some additional, um, potentially some additional signage to clarify. Um, and then and there are, I, I will say too, just on, on a signage note, there is, um, you know, warning signs in advance of the roundabouts, letting drivers know that the roundabout's coming up, as well as lane use signs, which will kind of, um, help drivers to choose lanes as they're entering the roundabout so they know which lane to be in. Because the idea is that once you enter the roundabout, you just stay in your lane and you can complete whatever movement you want to complete. Thank you, Brett. All right, I'm going to go back on mute. Uh, but project team, let's stick around just in case we still got quite a few uh, participants in the workshop. So we'll, we'll hang out. I had one more additional question come in. Uh, which design vehicle was considered oversized to use uh, for the yellow hatched area in the roundabout? So the, the inside apron of the roundabouts that, that we were talking about was designed to accommodate a WB67, which is really the largest vehicle that we designed for. Uh, it's a large you know tractor trailer type of a uh, truck so um, again the the movements can be made uh, by all the all the vehicles that would use them and that is what they're for uh, they're there to accommodate those larger vehicles so uh, wb67 all right it's been about 10 minutes uh, we haven't had any more questions come through and most folks have started to uh, to leave the workshop so um, we're going to sign off on um, behalf of the project team just want to thank you all for your participation tonight. And you have, again, until March 25th uh, to, to uh, is, is the end date for the comment period for this project. And uh, please look out for uh, updates to our project website for all of this uh, material. And um, thank you again. Have a good night.